you welcome everyone and thank you for joining us here at the Mechanics Institute. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events. Um, we're very pleased to welcome you to our program, The Man Who Lit Lady Liberty, The Extraordinary Rise and Fall of Actor M.B. Curtis with author Richard Schwartz. And tonight we're very proud to co-sponsor our program with the San Francisco Historical Society. And for those of you who are new to the Mechanics Institute, how many people have never been here before? Welcome, welcome. Um, we just want to mention that we do have a free tour of the Institute on Wednesday at noon, so please join us if you'd like to have a tour of our library, chess room, and then all that, and learn about our history. But I will give you a little brief introduction. We were founded in 1854, and we're one of San Francisco's most vital literary and cultural centers in the heart of the city. As I mentioned, we feature our general interest library on the second and third floors. We have our international chess club down the hallway, and we have ongoing author and literary programs and our cinema lit film series on Friday night. So please visit our website and come join us for any one of our wonderful programs. After our presentation, uh, we'll open up to you, our audience, for a Q&A. And Richard has many books to sell, so I hope that you will enjoy this program and consider picking up a book um, <coughs> at the back. And also, you can see we have some beautiful uh, visuals, graphics of MV Curtis. So a little background, if you thought that Ember Norton was quite the character of San Francisco, you are in for a treat. Uh, this book is a picturesque biography of immigrant and entrepreneur M.B. Curtis of San Francisco, whose claim to fame was on stage and in silent films, but also includes many extraordinary ventures as an actor, producer, real estate developer, promoter, hotelier, benefactor, and a murder suspect, which you will hear about very shortly. Richard Schwartz is a historian and the author of Eccentrics, Heroes, and Cutthroats of Old Berkeley, Earthquake Exodus 1906, Berkeley 1900, and The Circle of Stones, originally from Philadelphia, he graduated from Temple University with a, with a bachelor's degree in English literature. An outdoor enthusiast and animal lover, Schwartz worked on a Pennsylvania <coughs> Dutch farm for two years before heading west to higher mountains. <laughs> he now lives in Berkeley, uh, where he works as a building contractor and documents early American, Native American sites in the Bay Area. The Man Who Lit Liberty, Lady Liberty, Liberty, is his fifth book and was selected by the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences Margaret, Margaret Herrick Library to be included in their collection. The book was also recently awarded the Bronze Medal in the 2018 Independent Publisher Book Awards. So please welcome Richard Schwartz to Mechanics Institute. station in the United States. It had just opened the year prior, and it was the immigration station until Ellis Island opened in 1891. It was much easier to enter the United States through Old Mexico. <coughs> he was said to be the most energetic kid in his neighborhood. His father had a tavern. He, he was a distiller. And on literary night, 
Maurice would go on top of barrels and spout Shakespeare, and everybody knew he was bound for the stage. When the Civil War erupted, an 11-year-old Maurice tried to join the 15th Michigan Infantry as a drummer boy, but they rejected him due to his extreme youth. He ran away a lot. He drops out of school at 14 years old. He finally leaves town, goes to Chicago, where he works as a call boy at Big Vickers Theater to be close to the theater. He stayed there until 1869, when he got his first acting role at 20 years old. He began to travel the United States and Canada for work. In about 1871, he changed his name from Moritz Bertram Strellinger to Maurice Bertram Curtis, M.B. Curtis. This is a young M.B. Curtis in probably about 20, 25 years old. San Francisco in the 1870s was struggling mightily economically. There was a national economic depression in 1873 when the bank financing the second transcontinental railroad, the second transcontinental railroad called the Northern Pacific failed and that brought down all kinds of other banks and institu institutions. California lurched into this economic depression in the summer of 17, 1875 when William C. Ralston's Bank of California failed. By 1877, most everything in San Francisco was economically lifeless. Then, the consolidated mine stopped paying its dividend monthly, signaling a silver crash. Already vulnerable, times grew even worse in the theatrical industry in San Francisco from this latest financial catastrophe. The Bush Street Theater closed for a couple of months. The Baldwin, the Alhambra, and others followed suit. This is the California Theater. Uh, it was located at what is now 440 Bush Street, and you can go see the plaque on the wall. This was built by William C. Ralston the, from the Bank of California. Curtis came here for work and he worked with a manager named David Belasco. It was said that this company was probably never equaled by another American theater. Many of, most every person in this troupe went on to national fame and an amazing career, and a number of them wound up working with Curtis when Curtis formed his own troupe. So he's, he's really getting a hell of an education. He had about 120 different roles, from Shakespeare to tragedy, to low comedy. So he was very well-rounded. Uh, in 1876, he got a role in a very significant play called The Mighty Dollar, where Curtis played a black servant. It was a comic role. It mirrored a similar issue that Curtis had in his own life, that a number of ethnic groups were not allowed to portray themselves on stage, and they were just inserted to be mocked. M many immigrant groups. By August of that year, I'm going to quote what the main theatrical newspaper said about San Francisco. The theatrical life of San Francisco had been dull, flat, unprofitable, and they possessed the appearance of continuing so for some time to come. The riotous amusements of a lawless mob, the depressed state of the times, and the poverty of attraction at the different theaters have been potent reasons for the mighty beggarly army array of empty benches. The Grand Opera House and Baldwin's remain closed. Anybody want to guess what this lawless mob, the amusements of a lawless mob? This was August 1877. On July 23rd to 25th, there was a riot in Chinatown by mostly other immigrants. Uh, they burned, four people were killed, a lot of property destroyed. That's what that has to refer to. As fall settled on the Bay Area, Curtis somehow continued to find work at the California Theater and the Grand Opera. Now, this is the Bush Street Theater. It's between, it was between Kearney and Montgomery. It, oh no, I'm sorry. This is the California Theater in better times. And you can see the activity, the dress. 
This is the Bush Street Theater. Uh, it could hold 2,000 people. In the winter of 1877, uh, the renowned actor Joseph Klein Emmett played four weeks at the theater in a play called Our Cousin Fritz. Now here he is in a trade car. Trade cards were very big back then as Fritz. And this was a very important play, significant play. And here you see the playbill. And if you look down, you'll see M.B. Curtis portraying Julius Snow, who was the African-American servant. Kind of an odd name. Huh? Um, the local newspaper said, and, and this was about a German immigrant. Fritz was a German immigrant. It was well supported as the following names bear witness. And M.B. Curtis's name, business very good. This play success was believed to have started a whole, uh, spawned many German immigrant character studies that followed. Uh, here is a poster of a German immigrant comic. How do we know he's an immigrant? Without any other information, you know he's an immigrant. If you look to the right of the poster, there it is again, Castle Clinton, the immigration station. So they would put that in there as a clue. You guys, this is about an immigrant. That's all you need to know. And you can date this, not having any other information, because on the left, there's the Statue of Liberty, October 28th, 1886. So it's probably somewhat after that. This is the old Grand Opera House. It was the, on the north side of Mission between 3rd and 4th Streets. By early 1878, a new season opened, and they used a production of a reconstructed version of Uncle Tom's Cabin. And Curtis took the part of Marx the lawyer. And the newspaper said his efforts were repeatedly applauded. Back at the Bush Street Theater, during the Christmas of that year, Curtis gave a special benefit comical performance to 800 children at a matinee where he played Julian Krantz, a Dutchman with difficulties, and the newspaper said he was especially meritorious. Um, Curtis was always doing benefits. If he came to a, a city and a fireman had just died fighting a fire, he would stop his performances, do a benefit for the family, he was always doing this. Now, does anybody know who this is? It's a man, he was an actor, and he, he was a pretty well-known actor. He made a grand living at portraying a Chinese male on stage. His name is Charles Paslow. Why did he make a grand living? Because the Chinese male was not allowed on the American stage. And that's what he specialized in. Here he is in that same year, 1879, portraying Wing Li in a play called My Partner. Now, the Chinese community had their own theater, which had its own culture and structure in Chinatown. And some non-Chinese people went, and it was a very exotic, dangerous thing for them to go. This is David Belasco, who was the manager at the California and the Baldwin. Um, for, and he was Jewish. For Jewish actors, they were barely able to penetrate even a minor level of success, and they never could play some, portray someone of their own ethnic background. And due to a lack of opportunity, many of them, instead of trying to butt their heads against this acting barrier, they went on to different sections of the theatrical trade, like stagehands, like writers, like producers. And David Belasco and Oscar Hammerstein are two examples. The theatrical role of the stage Jew had changed little in the second half of the 19th century from the material originally imported from Europe, which is where everything began in the United States theater. They didn't have their own tradition yet, so they took things from Europe. This was one of them. The Jew was inserted to be laughed at. They were always codified by names like Moses, Levi, Mordecai, Solomon, and seldom anything else. 
They were limited to a repertoire of yelling things like, Suffering Moses! Or, oh, Rebecca, a bunch of thoughts and vents, and that was it. They weren't portrayed as human beings. They were portrayed as, as, a, as a pile of stereotypes, often very negative. This was the Baldwin Hotel, which contained the Baldwin Theater, where David Belasco was the manager. Uh, if you look to the left of it, that's where the uh, cable car turnaround is now. And where the Baldwin Hotel stood is where the flood building stands. Pretty amazing, huh? So now we come to 1880. And this is the big year. This is the year M.B. Curtis introduced his character, Samuel Posen, for the first time. And no, no, produce, no producer in New York City would touch it. So he contacted his brother, they formed a troupe, and in one tour of the country, it changed everything. By the time he got back, he was one of the top three actors in the country, and he was a very wealthy man in one tour. And this went on every year, year after year. He was interviewed about this. Of course, when you have a successful play, there's going to be a million stories of how the play was thought out or spawned. Uh, and in one of the interviews, Curtis said, uh, the germination of the play was in San Francisco. And I'll read you some from that interview in his own words. And, and I got to tell you first that a drummer is another word for a traveling salesman. And if you're as old as I am, uh, you remember as a kid, even on TV, there were those guys with the briefcases with a strap around their neck and they would open it up to show you their wares. That's a drummer. And they could be individuals who just got some wares and were selling them, or they could represent a manufacturer and they could go around with samples. Um, there was a very funny drummer here at the time, a man called Wolf. He was perhaps one of the most comical men I have ever met. And for the life of me, I could never refrain from giving imitations of them. I'm a member of the Bohemian Club, he was, I checked. And whenever I wanted to create a laugh, I would just give them the wolf. So he did one of their hijinks, and he saw that both this role reached something deep inside him, and that the people in the audience were mesmerized. They were lit. He could feel them in his hand. And he realized, this is my one chance. I'm either going to live in this flop house for the rest of my life. Even though he was a very good actor, he was a supporting actor. And he could barely eat. So he bought the play for more money than he had. And began that tour. And that was the beginning of Samuel Posen. And from the get-go, critics were stunned, and everybody was talking about it. It was a play you had to see. Little, little theaters in small towns were, were, were getting operatic rates. They would empty the orchestra pit so they could fit more people in. Every place was packed every night. Some people saw the play over 10 times over the years. And Curtis always kept it up to date. If plaids were the the fad, and, you know, 1884, he would be wearing plaids. If uh, diamond studded um, collar picks were the fad, he would make sure he had them. He was always changing the lines, but the mastery that he had was not as much that. I, I've read the play. It, you won't get anything from reading it. It's a standard Victorian melodrama comedy. Um, and, and the critics of his day said this as well. It was his ad libs. It was his timing. It was his pretend struggle with the English language as a, as a, as a greenhorn immigrant uh, who was trying his best. And people couldn't love this character more. So one, I'll read you a couple of quotes. Samuel Posen is like nothing which is in the heavens nor the earth beneath. The evenness of his monotone is irresistible, and the characters of accent may have been the original. Furthermore, the exacting realism of the day has come to demand that a Jew play a Jew's part, 
Samuel Poulsen is throughout an adapted play rather than a written one, which is basically what we were just talking about. His timing was magical, uh, and, and he did mesmerize audiences, and they would not stop laughing. But there were serious messages in the comedy, like most comedy, um, not what was in the script. Um, his, his struggle with the English language, if he wanted to say, you know, here's my good, that's a half a dollar, he would, he would say, uh, well, that's a hell of a dollar. And people would just keep, you know, long after the play was over, they repeat that. And I'll, and I'll get to later on, even Mark Twain was saying it. Um, Curtis told the Mirror that he spent three quarters of an hour every night putting on an exaggerated wax nose. Why? Because prior to him, a Jew was not allowed, a Jewish character was not allowed to be played unless they had that exaggerated nose and a bunch of other things. So his character, although it made a tremendous leap, did not get rid of all the stereotypes and the negative things. It just broke from them. And he, he was so, you know, the, the, in the old days, you had to have the nose, the beard, the long coat, the hat, and you would be emotionally clothed in scurrilous attributes from wholly, wholly imported from the European stage. Many critics called Curtis's portrayal the first portrayal of the modern Jew, or the first portrayal of the American Jew. For the first time, it wasn't just a pile of negative attributes not amounting to a human character. He was a human character. And for the first time in American stage history, the audience laughed with the Jewish character, not at the Jewish character. And the, it was a seismic change. Um, do you want some stockings, he insinuates? They're very fine, to pair for a cuvater of a hell of a dollar. <laughs> you know, and it was a guy who was somewhat foolish, but always himself, and he was trying. And I think that's what made it such a personal performance, because who doesn't relate to that? You know, everybody's hiding behind the human mask, and there Samuel Posen with no mask. And he couldn't have a mask because he had nothing to hide behind. So um, he, it, one, one local paper said he's very quiet, natural, and unassuming, this character. and made no attempt to caricature or burlesque, burlesque his part. His dialect is easy and unforced, and it's better dialect than the usual broken German of the stage. The audience understood all his points. He was making all these inside jokes that working people would understand, but the critics and the Victorian power brokers, oh my. Suspenders and socks, four for a hell of a dollar. The audience was kept in a continual roar of laughter, literally. Now, drummers were considered to be a very dangerous group of people. Why? They were on the road. They were away from their wives. They were away from their religious leaders. They were away from their bosses. They could do anything they wanted. That's dangerous to late 19th century America. So the other thing was they were outsiders. Um, the railroad changed everything, both for the theater and for small town America and for commerce. So now the drummer would get on the railroad and it would go to this tiny little town which used to be so isolated they would have no news of the city and many of them didn't want it. Now all of a sudden the drummer comes in. It was good and bad. They had all these amazing goods that they would have never had access to. But they also felt like the city was coming to them where they wanted their own culture their country culture. And there was another fear, which we'll get into more with Mark Twain. It was the fear that if you're selling something, you're losing your self to sell it. That scared the hell out of Americans. But they dealt with it really quickly. Um, 
So here's here's Curtis with uh, all, all, also being very awkward, uh, selling buttons and scarves and socks and suspenders, and he's got that smile and that goofy look. This was another trade card. I'll own the whole place in a couple of years. So this was, you can see, he's the young, innocent Samuel Posen. Um, and you could collect all six and you turn them over and it says Samuel Posen at the Grand Opera. You know, so that these were things to attract people. Now here's another shot of Curtis. And you'll notice the ulster, which is a long overcoat, uh, it's pretty thin. All the successful people or the proper people wore ulsters back in this period. So Samuel has an ulster, but it's not a very good one. He's kind of got an awkward tie and not quite the right hat. Now, here you can see the change. Now he's a, he's a real American. He's got the Spats shoes, he's got you know, the right briefcase, the right hat, and he's even showing you the lining of his plaid coat. And I can't tell you how many critics talked about, even if there wasn't a wasted movement with Curtis, everything he did communicated something, and it was usually funny or awkward. And even showing the lining, somehow, who knows how he did it, caused people to break out laughing. Curtis had a sumptuous wardrobe prepared. He once, once vests were the, the fad of the year. And he was in San Francisco and he went to Wilkes Bashford because they were open back then. And he bought like 12 vests all at once. And he was gonna use them, you know. And it became, well, you know, that's a Curtis, all right. Uh, he was known for these eccentricities and uh, theatrical nature. Uh, sumptuous wardrobe prepared for Samuel Posen to wear in the new comedy. The plaids are the largest and the silks the gaudiest <laughs> ever manufactured. He was, you know, he's trying to make it gaudy because Samuel Posen didn't know the ball game yet. In 1894, it was said the drummer of today is always stylish and well dressed gentleman, and Mr. Curtis relegated his old plaids and stripes to the past. That was 1884. And in their place, we'll show all the latest fads and dress, not forgetting, of course, jeweled studs in his collar, which seemed to be the latest craze. So he was constantly changing the play to make it up to date. This is a fascinating poster. There's four characters. Who are they? They're all Samuel Posen. <laughs> on, on the left is the greenhorn immigrant. He doesn't have anything right except he's out there trying. The next guy, his ulster, well, he's got an ulster, but it's thin, uh, wrong tie, wrong hat, and he kind of looks still kind of a little awkward at Samuel Posen. And the guy to his right, well, that's Samuel Posen, the drummer in the proper shoes, the proper pants, the proper hat, the proper ulster. And he really knows the ropes now. And the guy on the far right, well, he's at the top of his game. He probably doesn't even leave. You know, he probably got a store and doesn't need to leave it. So this is, this is the, uh, an Americanization of Samuel Post and all in one poster. Anybody want to tell me why we know he's an immigrant? It's because if you look behind them, there's Castle Clinton. That's the signal. He's an immigrant. This is the beautiful Marie Curtis, MB's wife. Her born name was Marie Alphonsine Floranger. She was schooled in the nunnery in Montreal. She, in Samuel Posen, she played a very difficult role, a fiery French adventuress um, and, mur and murderer, uh, you know, with strong dashes of high color, quite Turner-esque in their suggestions of the emotional. <laughs> Not easy role to play. 
People said, Mrs. C's delicious accent and merry laugh were not something they could capture on paper. She would come out in a gray gown that was actually her grandmother's. Next, she wore a hundred-year-old hat. In another, a cherry and blue velvet brocade, her bodice and shoulder pieces radiated with lace. The costume changed every act. Her jewelry, much of it was antique, were as notable as her gowns, and they were always noted in the paper. Miss Demur dresses with great taste and plays her difficult part carefully. Now there's a, this story over the years as I researched, it kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So here I'm researching this and I'm researching Marie, and it turns out who's connected? Marie Antoinette. How was Marie Antoinette connected? Marie Antoinette was given a huge topaz ring surrounded by diamonds by the Duke of Soiree in 1783 in Marie Antoinette's country home in Chantilly. Years went by, and a few weeks before she was executed, she gave this ring as a token of friendship to her wine merchant's wife. The wine merchant's wife was Marie Curtis's great-grandmother. So she got that ring. She got that ring, and she, it was said she would wear it for good luck, but only on the stage. One other thing connected with Marie, with Albina, Albina de Mer was her stage name, uh, was a revival of an old tradition that was started by manager Lester Wallace, a fam famous manager in the United States. And that was, he understood, like a good contractor, you take care of your guys and your guys. So after, after the play was over, he would put out this amazing banquet of food for his actors and actresses. And they loved it and they appreciated it. God knows they were hungry. Well, when times got bad, or if you had a frugal manager, they would put out teas colored to look like wine and fake meats on the table. Now, I would love to know what Beyond Meat product they, they came up with. And I know it would be better than ours because they didn't have processed foods. So Albina brought that tradition back. And in 1883, she laid out this incredible table. She did, she did matinee performances of Camille. And after it was done, she put out oysters fried and raw, roast turkey, chicken salad, and real wines, and they never forgot her. They talked about that for years. She was no slouch when it came to acting, although she didn't intend to be an actress. Um, she only did it because Moritz asked her to fill in for something that was missing. She performed with a young Humphrey Bogart in a production called Nerves, and she performed in early movies. Um, so she, in her own right, was quite something, and quite something to, to look at in her gowns. Now here's a pamphlet that was a giveaway for the play Samuel Posen. Here's what the dramatic mirror of the authority on American stage said in 1889. The American plays were so important to our nation and culture, yet the critics are most hard on them. What series of imported plays can be set up alongside that remarkable series of American character sketches, which begins with Rip Van Winkle, and which includes Kit, The Gilded Age, The Almighty Dollar, Davy Crockett, The Dainties, Samuel Posen, my partner. Curtis had taken his place in the top eight plays in our nation's culture. And nobody ever heard of it. And I just find this amazing. Um, in, in reference uh, to his coat, um, said he, it, it flutters like a hummingbird between plaids and stripes, between blue and green. It flutters like a hummingbird. No motion he did was regular. It was all like a theatrical Tai Chi, and it just sucked people in never to return. Uh, Samuel had a regular name, the character Samuel. He wasn't, you know, Mordecai. Or, he had no beard. He didn't behave in a dishonest or harsh way. He was happy. He had friends. He treated people well. He had a love interest. He wanted the same footing and opportunities as those around him with whom he wanted to interact and relate to. 
This was a totally new thing. It's hard for us to comprehend how, what a change that was. Shylock. One critic said, Shylock is one thing, Samuel opposing another. From Samuel Posen, the commercial drummer, angels and ministers of grace defend us. It's, a very, it's very vile in the sense of offense in this, to any person who claims even an approach to refined feelings. Uproarious laughter on the part of the audience greeted his uncouth movements, his mean setups, and his drummer camp. The reviewer also resented that there was a big portion of the audience, both Christian and Jewish, that was getting the humor, and he didn't. Um, because the jokes were not understandable to a refined American. What he's really saying is, and he clearly doesn't know it yet, it's coming out as disgust, but it's really fear. He's watching his whole world, which he's safely in the bosom of, the Victorian culture, being eroded rather quickly. In the theater, it used to be that only the elites could choose what plays would be run by putting out a lot of money to have them produced. Now, there were a lot of working people and a lot of people who were immigrants that had been here for a little while, and they were getting established. They could buy a ticket to the theater for themselves, their wives, and often their families, and now they have a vote of what's going to be successful by buying those tickets never had that before. And the critic was like trying to hold on to something that was already gone. America had already changed, never to go back to that old way. Um, so, and, and the critic said, what's wrong with Shylock? Any, you know, if it was performed right, any, any Jewish person would be proud. You know, proud to be a pile of negative stereotypes. You know, uh, it was incredible to read this. Um, but I also have sympathy for the guy because he could feel his whole world was coming to an end, and that's got to be threatening. His mistake, and the reason it wasn't a right feeling, was it's not his call to stand in the way and to own the culture. And luckily, he didn't. So there were a lot of studies on character portrayals in the late 19th century. And what they came up with was it was better to be seen and even mocked than to be left out. But if you could be seen with no malice, and, and, and you, if one could be laughed at with no malice, one could put one's guard down and join in the humor. But if not, it was better to be included and get what little piece of positive feedback you could than to be left out entirely, like many groups were. One theatrical manager said Samuel was the most truthful and artistic portrayal of the type he impersonated that the stage had ever known. And this is things going well, there's the critic. Now, here things are going well, but it's like problems keep jumping up. This was a poster for the play. And there's Hebrew letters up at the top. And some critics said, you know, this method of advertising a farcical play is likely to offend a number of sensitive and worthy people. And the spirit of the times responded to this. And they said, sensitive and worthy people are not offended when Bernhardt is advertised in French, or Gertzinger in German, or Bokio in Irish on Gallic and green poster paper. So why was this? You know, and, and they ended with, um, Samuel Posen will probably keep the boards all summer, so we shall have plenty of time to discuss the subject. Here's a, another handout. The most strikingly, most strikingly original, purely national and successful characterization ever presented on the American stage. And on the back of it, you'll see about the fourth paragraph, it's, <clears throat> it's supposed to be like what a drummer would have. 
Uh, and, and they told that when drummers are on the trains, they usually sit together. Well, I found this. This is one of the best pen and inks I've ever seen. Uh, here are two drummers telling, you know, they had to have good jokes to tell. And stories, they had so many stories to tell each other. Well, they're having a great time. A little loud, a little not refined. But look at the kid on the right. They're doing what they want. Nobody's telling them what to do. And you see behind him, his mom's keeping a close eye on him. He's looking up to these guys. And the woman in between the two drummers, the sneer on her face was worth the 20 years of research to find this. Uh, it, it says more than words could. Here's a drummer, a refined drummer, coming into a small town, obviously by the railroad. And what this pen and ink shows you is he's of a different world. He's of a different culture. He's from the city. And the little towns, they would have taxes on these guys to keep them out or make it impossible for them to come in. You know, that special license that was so expensive, that would keep them out. So drummers were having a hard time. There were even lady drummers. Here's a play about a lady drummer. But God knows these were only in urban areas during the daylight. Being a drummer was a dangerous profession, especially when you got out in the boonies. They got robbed, and mm, sometimes they got killed. And it happened enough that they had to band together to protect themselves. And they formed an insurance company that if they got killed, this insurance would get their bodies back to their families. And that made them feel better. Now, it turns out, and I didn't know this, um, that insurance company still exists. And, and as a, quite the coincidence, my home is insured to this insurance company. Anybody want to guess what it is? Travelers. <laughs> Once you get it, it's go, of course. <laughs> so here's, here's a poster of an Irish caricature. The, the, the newspapers of the day said, they were the most vehement applauders of songs and sketches in the variety shows where the Irishman was represented as drunk and unfaithful, as well as earthy and merry. The point was, all the laughing didn't take away from the good feelings of the character. And the character, almost exclusively, was portrayed by an Irish actor. So you can make fun of yourself, but it doesn't take away from the wonderful person you are. And you can laugh at your faults. That was a huge thing. And they got to portray their own ethnic group. This is, a, this is an amazing document. Um, I've stared at this for a long, long time, many times. This was from the periodical Puck in 1883. This is three years after the play was introduced. And in it are all, everybody who's anybody in Washington is in this. And they're all dressed up like Samuel and Posey. And they all have their wax noses on. And they're coming to Columbia there on the left, meaning the government, with what they want to sell, their programs. Um, and you'll notice on the balcony in the, on the right, there's Uncle Sam looking down on them. And, and Columbia is saying, you know, uh, not today, maybe some other day. Uh, you, you can see uh, that's Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, that's General Sherman. This is Blaine, who was a, a speaker of the House and was for um, African American uh, suffrage. Um, Chester Arthur, who would become president. Um, you know, everybody was in this poster. Um, he, he was nominated Duke of Posen at Mardi Gras. He was the first man to do a benefit performance for the Actors Fund to form. When an actor got sick or injured, they could be on the street and die because they didn't have any money. So the tradition was you stop and you do a benefit. Well, they, that was very difficult. So they formed the Actors Fund. 
He was the first to do a benefit. He collected more than anybody. And at the end of his life, who do you think he was taken care of by? The actors for him. Samuel Paul's in Five Cent Cigars. He was like the first, you know, it's like a Disney movie where you know, there are all the dolls and this and that. Well, they're cigars. I never thought I'd see one, but this year, here's the, here's the cigar box. Um, they said, just, as Samuel Posen says, just give, all we want is a chance. Give us that. So everybody was using Samuel Posen. Anybody recognize this guy? Good. He's a pickpocket from 1904, arrested <laughs> in Boston. And look at his alias, Sam of Posen. So, so that's the low. And now, everybody knows who this is, right? Yep. President Teddy Theodore Roosevelt, 1905, 25 years after the play was introduced, was said to be the only Samuel Posen in Washington. So you could see the penetration of, of the culture of this play. Charlie Chaplin, you thought those big oversized shoes were his invention. They weren't, they were Curtis's. Someone imitated Chaplin, Chaplin sued him, they went to court and the imitator said, well, all, all these features you put together weren't yours originally. Those shoes were done by M.B. Curtis long before you. And uh, I called a clown museum to, to make sure it wasn't clowns in their juice, and they said, no, we, we didn't <laughs> use them way back then. So it sounds like it is true um, that, that what he used in the tramp uh, was from M.B. Curtis. Everybody knows who this is. Um, here's, I'm gonna give a quote from uh, a review of Curtis. His elbow and wrist are eloquent. No one had portrayed that before on stage. One critic described the attention uh, getting way, the way Curtis curled his hand, placed his, placed his chin on it, and brought, it brought to mind Jack Benny so many years later. Uh, these things were just passed down, and, and they lost who invented them. It was M.P. Curtis. So he comes back to San Francisco, he opens a new play, it's not successful, it starts driving him nuts. Here's a poster, spot cash. Uh, anytime he was in trouble, he went back to Samuel Posier, the street theater. Here's spot cash. He also tried a play called The Sachin, which was a marriage broker. And in all these failures, um, the critics said his acting is still amazing, and, and, but the writers failed him. In this, in this one, the combination of a serious theme and Curtis's comedy were never able to be combined well enough. There's where it was placed. He goes to New York in 1886. The Statue of Liberty had been dedicated three days earlier. He's opening a new play. He's an immigrant. He wants to see it lighting up the harbor for the world. He gets there, it's cloaked in darkness. He goes up to a government guy, he says, what's going on? This is supposed to light up the harbor for the world. He goes, oh, go on, you little immigrant. Congress paid to light it up through the dedication. And that's all they want to do. They're not paying for it anymore. And he points to the guy and he says, if you don't light it, I will. Yeah, sure, go on, get out of here. He goes, he finds the guys who are making the electricity for the lights, takes $800 out of his pocket, which is like 30000 now, <laughs> slams it on the table, points to the statue, and he says, boys, light it up. And he did. Mm -hmm. They did. And for the two and a half weeks that Curtis performed in New York City, he lit the Statue of Liberty. Nobody knows this. I, I even flew to New York and met with the Statue of Liberty historians. They, they knew he offered. They didn't know it happened. It did. It so embarrassed Congress, they changed their minds and funded lighting the Statue of Liberty. So if it's not for this forgotten immigrant, the Statue of Liberty wouldn't be lit today. Um, I guess I'm just about out of time. Mark Twain approached Curtis to do a theatrical version of Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. Curtis said, I'll do it. I, I'd love to do it. But my requirement would be, it would be Samuel of Posen in King Arthur's Court, and he has to be portrayed, Hank has to be an American Jew, like Samuel Posen. And Twain said, you know, that's a brilliant idea. The two characters are very similar. 
Um, and he accepted those terms. And it was just a matter of coming to terms. Curtis was on the road. He was supposed to come back, and they were going to sign a contract. Twain got desperate because he had desperate needs for money. And he told his agent, just take anything. I need the money. And they signed up a couple of uh, writer, uh, producers in New York, but they never happened, and that was it. Uh, there's no time to tell you about the night Curtis took his wife to see Sarah Bernhardt and Camille at the Grand Opera and was walking back. He got mugged. He was accused of murdering a very popular, good San Francisco police officer. He endured three trials. Um, I won't tell you what happened. I don't want to spoil it. Um, and this is just the beginning of this man's story. Um, he, he, he gave away land. He gave away lots in Tehama County to come see his play when it wasn't doing well. There was like 10,000 people that, that, that utilized it. No one had ever done that before. Hearst copied him uh, at the turn of the century. He built this hotel in Berkeley, tallest hotel in the Bay Area, Peralta Park Hotel. You can see it in the background how out of scale it is. And you can see what an incredible place it was because everything he did was theatrical. Uh, I'm going to stop here uh, to enable everyone to ask questions. And I, I thank you for listening. <laughs> and, and, and just so you know, I could do another 10 of these. <laughs> and I'll put you on Samuel Post. Let this be the first attempt. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> um, we're going to open for questions. If you have a question, raise your hand. I will bring you the microphone. I just wondered, you had said Jews were not allowed in the theater, but was Curtis himself Jewish? Yes. It wasn't that they weren't allowed. It's that they weren't allowed to portray a Jewish character. Just, just like no African American until after the turn of the century was allowed to portray an African American, and Chinese weren't allowed in the theater. But he, he was Jewish. He was so Jewish. So he was the first one to portray a Jew. Uh, right, and um, and do it with humanity. That's what you know, and and I think it's like what we talk about with the Irish portrayals. You can laugh at yourself. Everybody's got traits that are foolhardy, but it didn't ruin the good feelings. And that's what Curtis brought in, which was monumental. Anybody else? Question here. <clears throat> so I, I live in Berkeley near uh, Posen and Curtis Streets. Are they named after this guy? No and yes. <laughs> uh, Curtis Street was named after the Irish immigrant farmer, Michael Curtis. Posen was named after Samuel Posen because it was part of that hotel development. Albina Street was Albina Demur. There was um, Carlotta Street. Uh, Wilkes Bashford's manager came to Curtis and said, I want to buy a couple of lots in your development, but I only want to do it if you name a street after my wife. He says, sure, what's your wife's name? Carlotta. Uh, you know, so, but back in the day, there was a street named Curtis by his development that was named after him, and now it's Monterey. Oh. So you, you were essentially right, but now you know a lot more than yeah. most people. Yes, in back. Do you know, was he, was he influenced by the Yiddish theater, and was there Yiddish theater in the Bay? Uh, I've never seen anything written about that. Um, his father was more religious. The, th the thing, part of this answer is interesting in that they were from Hungary. Now, most of the other European nations kept all the Jews in a ghetto. And if you weren't behind those locked doors at the end of the day, you were killed. So they could only have certain jobs. So they turned to their religion as the only thing they had available to them. So they were really tight with their religion. Hungary was the exception in Europe. In Hungary, you could join the military. You could own property. You could do any job you wanted. 
and there was pub mandatory public school. So the immigrants from the Jewish immigrants from Hungary were much less tied to their religion than most of the other European nations. Curtis grew up in that attitude, so he he wanted he could participate more in society, so he wasn't so focused on his religion. You know, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. You're I'll, very welcome. I'll just interject here that there was in San Francisco a Yiddish theater. It did exist. I it can't give you all the details. That's but okay, but thank it did, you. It did exist. Any other questions? John, you have a question? Coming your way. <laughs> so I'm, I'm looking at the architecture there, and it's obviously uh, throwback to the Ottoman Empire, maybe Alhambra or Taj Mahal. But with all the characters throughout history, how did you pick Curtis? Okay. Uh, before I get to that, John is JP Electric, one of the finest electrical <laughs> contractors in the Bay Area. I, I know. I'm a con I was a contractor. This was finished in 1890. It had electricity. It had gas heat. It had, the, the lighting fixtures were in the form of tulips. This place was like mind-boggling. We can't imagine what it was like. The town would stand around the place and just gawk. And if the lights went on at night, they were, they were blown away. They'd never seen electricity. So it was really innovative. Now, I forgot what you asked. <laughs> so the Ottoman Empire was still expanding at the time, and the architecture is that style, like Alhambra in Spain. Um, and I don't know. I don't know what brought him to create this. But I'll, what brought, I'll tell you what I think it was. What brought you to focus on him? Okay. The Alcazar Theater was the Gothic architecture, and I think a lot of that influenced him for his combined architecture of his hotel. What got me was this. Um, I started reading every out-of-print Berkeley history I could find, and they all had the same exact pablum about a little bit about M.B. Curtis. No one had ever done any research on them. So I started researching it, and the story got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then after you know, 10, 15 years, I'd come into the Statue of Liberty and Mark Twain. Uh, I, have to, you know, I have to stay with this wherever it leads. Th there are so many things about this guy. It's like he lived 30 lives in one. Um, and, the, and the trials in San Francisco for the murder were unbelievable, they were national news. Uh, he was never the same after that. Um, How old was he when he was put on trial? Maybe 32, 34. He lived to be like 80. Thank you for coming back. He lived to be 80. Um, and, and once his trouble started, he drank heavily. So it's kind of amazing he lived as long as he did. Uh, his wife, I mean, they had this amazing relationship. And they would travel, they loved animals. They had a deer park, they had dogs, they had uh, birds, and they even traveled with some of their favorite birds, Albina did. And um, I'll indulge you with this one quick story. They were in Austin, Texas. Back then there was no air conditioning, so they had transom windows over the doors that opened. And that was how you, you opened a window and you opened the transom and maybe got a little breeze. The transom was open. They had the parrots in the room. The governor of Texas was staying across the hall and he had a dinner to go to that night. So he's coming back to his room and as he passes Curtis's room, he hears somebody say, hey baby, why don't you come in for a kiss? <laughs> and the governor, you know, an ex-military man, very proper, stops. And he says, excuse me? Hey, baby, why don't you come in for a kiss? <laughs> and he's like, what is going on? And then he hears this gruff male voice, M.B. Curtis, why don't you leave the poor bird alone? <laughs> <laughs> How do I know this? This was a conversation in the hallway. How do I know this? Because this is the part that's even more amazing to me. He goes to his banquet, 
He was so tickled by the story, he tells everyone at the banquet, the newspaper reporter puts it in the paper, and 140 years later, I find it, and I'm telling you. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what impresses me. And, you know, the bird is smiling. <laughs> Anybody else? Did they have children? They did not. Uh, they did not. They, they, he had, they had relatives who had children, but they did not have children. Are there any of his descendants around still? Yes. One is a pilot for I think United Airlines. Where is he buried? He's buried in Los Angeles. Um, I, and the name of the place begins with a B, but it's in the book. It's, it's in the book. If you I'm trying to sell you a book. You can get it at the library or just look it up. And it, whatever. Buy the book. <laughs> Question over here. You, you said he was mugged. Did he actually kill the policeman? I can't tell you that. <laughs> because it would ruin the suspense. Uh, the police, I can tell you that the policemen uh, back then didn't wear uniforms most of the time. And on the cold San Francisco nights, they had heavy sweaters or coats, and some of them put their badges on, some didn't. So this policeman, who was a great guy from Nova Scotia, comes upon and sees this guy beating this guy and puts what's called nippers, which are handcuffs that tighten if you try and resist. He puts nippers on them both and he's bringing them to the station, the police station, which is like half a block away. And, uh, well, I can't, I can't tell you anymore. Because <laughs> <laughs> it'd be three hours would go by and then you, you wouldn't spoil it. It's, it's amazing, three trials. Buy the book. <laughs> All right then, so if there aren't any more questions, we'll let you peruse these beautiful